I just wanted to point out the, the aptness of the metaphor that we have here, um, which I'm going to speak about just, just briefly as we, as we have a little bit of an introduction. Um, we're discussing covenant theology and we're comparing it over against dispensationalism. Uh, two ways of thinking about the Bible, two ways of looking at how the scriptures fit together, work together, how that when we read them, um, the, the, the individual passages and words of scripture therefore make clearer sense because we understand how those passages all fit together. Um, and yet, underneath the, the overarching truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we can, we can have discussion and debate and we can, we can even disagree about this. Uh, and that's okay. Um, and I just thought it was a, a particularly apt metaphor that this discussion today is important and it is valuable and, and I'm, I'm going to argue that it's actually an essential thing for us to discuss and think about. But nevertheless, we have brothers and sisters who will continue to disagree with us and yet they remain our brothers and sisters. They remain uh, faithful to the Lord um, and, and I don't want us to forget that. So I just felt that was an apt metaphor for us to begin with. Um, so covenant theology versus dispensationalism. Um, and, and these two terms are, refer to two distinct and really very different ways of looking at the Bible and making sense of the Bible as a whole. Um, and that framework, that kind of framework, is sometimes known as a hermeneutic. It's a way of reading the Bible, a hermeneutic. You may have come across that word before. So, if we were to imagine ways of reading the Bible uh, on a line between uh, literal reading and a literal interpretation of the Scripture, across here to an allegorical um, interpretation of Scripture. So, literal simply means that the, the plain words of the Scripture are to be taken as at face value. There's no, there's no underlying, there's no hidden, there's no... Um, meaning to snatch at, if you like, it, it's there, it's plain in scripture. That would be right over there on the literal side. And then over here, the allegorical view of scripture is that the, the words themselves really just are there to present something else, something deeper, something underneath. And, and people have read the Bible in both of those two different kinds of ways. And I want to just start off by placing the two systems that we're thinking about today on that line. Because neither of them fully commits to one or the other. Um, within dispensationalism, the, the tendency is to read the Bible in a pretty much literal way. But in some cases where the, where the literal text makes it plain, there are times when we have to understand that there are other meanings there. So that, those might be types, those might be shadows, um, those might be um, parables and so on. So the literal text stands, but occasionally we might need, if the literal text leads us that way, we might need to see some allegorical meanings. So dispensationalism, dispensationalism isn't right over there on the literal side, but it's towards the literal. Covenant theology, similarly, isn't right over here on the allegorical side. It, is, it isn't mysticism. It isn't, it isn't Kabbalah. It isn't, um, it isn't magic and, and, and spells. It's allegorical predominantly um, or largely in the way that it deals with the overall span of what scripture teaches us. Um, but again, it's important for us to note that it is not completely allegorical. It's not completely abandoned the plain sense of scripture. So I just want us to be clear that we're not talking about a, com a complete departure towards the literal or to the allegorical uh, before we start. Both have... And this is where the difficulty comes, because both have a mixture or some kind of, um, yeah, some kind of mixture of the two in the ways that, that those two systems look at the Bible. Neither of them goes all the way, and that is where the difficulties and the inconsistencies potentially emerge. And there's obviously no way that in, in an hour or so that we can cover, uh, in cover uncover or, or, or touch on all of them. But we'll investigate a few and pick out some of the principles that hopefully will help us to read our Bibles rightly. 
Before we do get into those distinctions though, um, just a little bit more groundwork in terms of the Bible itself. The Bible itself. And I want to just pose um, three questions before we start even thinking about the differences between covenant theology and dispensationalism to set up why it's relevant to even be here today um, and, and why it's important to understand how the Bible fits together as a whole. So these are the three questions that I want you to have in the back of your mind um, as, we, as we talk through um, this first part today. First off, why should we try and make sense of the Bible? Because we as evangelical Christians, we, we take this for read. We take this as granted. We, we know the answer to this. But can we clearly express the answer to this question to people who have no interest, maybe have never even read the Bible? Can we explain to them why it's important to be able to make sense of the Bible as a whole, as a coherent text, if you like? Can the Bible be made sense of as a coherent whole? Not just a little bit, a nice story here and a nice story there and a little bit of information here and a little bit of information there, a nice parable um, and some nice sayings just potted um, around, but no, as an entire flow of narrative, as a, as a complete and coherent text, as a text that builds upon itself and makes sense within itself, can, we, can the Bible be made sense of as a coherent whole? And also, if we can't do that, if we can't make sense of the Bible as a whole, what then is, is at stake? <clears throat> we as, um, I, I refer to us as evangelical Christians, I presume most of us will be happy with that designation. You can tell me otherwise later, that's totally fine. But we'll, we'll go with that for now. So as, as evangelical Christians, we make our stand on the perfection of the Bible. Do we not? And so if the Bible is perfect... And if the Bible is infallible, then every level of its content should also be taken to be perfect and infallible. And, and the Bible itself, because it is God-given, because it is inspired by God, therefore it ought to be the basis for our entire existence. For everything that we are, everything that we think, everything that we do, Everything that we understand about the world around us should be coloured and shaped and framed by what the Bible has to say. It should, so it should inform us on specific matters. So the Bible should inform us on matters like euthanasia and abortion and marriage and the big one at the moment, gender identity and so on. The Bible should inform us about those issues. But at every level it's perfect. So it should also inform us about principles and ideas. So for example, those precepts that underpin those other things, so, such as love thy neighbour, is a principle and a precept that is a biblical one that we then apply in our lives. Render to no man evil for evil. Husbands, love your wives. So we have, we have these specific matters that the Bible touches on. We have general precepts and principles that the Bible touches on. And also, and importantly, we have a, a, an account of real life. Reality, if you like. An account of reality, what we see out there, what we feel to be true in our hearts, how we see people interact with one another, how, how God works in the world, how the Spirit moves us and how the Spirit moves others. All those things, that entire way of thinking about what reality actually is, has to accord with the Bible. In fact, it has to come from the Bible. Because the Bible is the perfect, inspired Word of God. So both, both reality itself and the Bible itself are coherent with one another. You'll see why I'm, I'm saying this in a moment. That, that this book, when you read in this book about how God works in the world, that is how he works in the world. Too, it seems to me that too, in too many circles, the Bible has lost its primacy. The Bible has lost its importance. The Bible has lost 
amongst too many Christians its power to determine everything else. And, and too many Christians divorce this from this, what they see outside. And so the nice stories and the floating axe heads and the talking serpents, they're, they're safely contained in here and we don't have to worry about any of that out in the world. Well, I'm saying that's the wrong way to look at, at the world. Because what that does is it leads some Christians to start selecting and rejecting or rereading certain parts of the Bible which plainly state, for example, that an axe head in one instance floated because it was the intervention of God and he's able to do that. Now, if, if your account of the world that you live in doesn't account for that, you're living in the wrong world. Amen. Okay, You're living in the wrong world. And so some Christians reject this part or that part of the Bible um, to try and search for this, this coherent whole outside of the Bible, away from the Bible, with only slight and scant reference to the Bible and, and the reality that the Bible presents. We try and base it on our own experiences rather than the revelation of God himself. And our own experiences, as we know, are, are coloured and tainted by our own sinful natures. The Bible, however, is not sinful, has no sinful nature, it's perfect. So this is where we start, not here. We start here, not here. We start in the book, not in our hearts. And so some Christians, for example, have tried to resolve the arguments thrown out by so-called, falsely so-called science, by, by rereading the Bible and trying to incorporate stuff from outside the Bible and trying to push it back in here. So there might be accounts of human origins, evolution and so on. Or the nature of man, what is man, David said. Or the central importance of marriage and the family has been discarded and then people have tried to read that back into the Bible. Um, God's plan for human well-being and welfare. People have their own ideas and they bring them to the Bible and they try to push them in. And these, these Christians, generally speaking, mean well. They're wrong, but they do mean well. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to defend Christianity, as they see it, against the decay that they see going on around. But they're doing it in the wrong way. It seems to me what has to be done is we have to return to an absolute security that the book is true. That is, that is the, the fundamental, this is why I'm talking about this now. Unless we see that the book is true, then we are wasting our time. All we're doing is talking about two competing fairy tales, and there's no point in that. Unless we see that the Bible is absolutely true in all of its regards, then, then we're wasting our time. So hopefully, we agree. So, for example, let me give you another example. That Non-Christians might say to us, do you really believe... That in the Garden of Eden, that it was a, a real actual garden, and there was a real actual Adam and a real actual Eve, and that there was a serpent that actually spoke to Eve. Do you, do you seriously believe that, they will say? And, and the well-meaning Christian might say, trying to bridge the divide, thinking that actually, is it, well, it's not a gospel issue, is it? So, so I, can, I can give a bit of ground here. The well-meaning Christian might therefore try and bridge that divide and say, well, it kind of depends what you mean. Um, they might say, well, it's a, it's a particular type of text, isn't it? Um, it? It's sort of shadowy code language. And so it, it teaches us important truths. And, and might shy away from simply saying, yeah, actually, I do believe that. Because that's what the Bible says. And it's an inadequate foundation for, for, uh, for looking at the Bible. The correct answer is to the question, do you really believe there was a talking serpent in the garden? The correct answer, the biblical answer is, yeah, I do, because the Bible tells me so. That, that's where we start from. And so, it seems to me, in our day, in our generation, we have to return to a faithful, biblical Christianity. And it won't be popular, and it won't be liked, and that's okay. Because it will be real, and it will be true, and that is more important. Yeah. This, is, this is the faith that's been delivered down to us through the ages. And only in accepting the entirety of biblical revelation as true revelation from a real God who expresses himself in words, in propositional form, only in accepting this can we hope ever to recover that bedrock of our society that has been decaying for, for decades, centuries now, that has in the past been there. So, 
moving to the to the issue at hand. Our, our purpose today is to try and understand how we can take the Bible seriously, how we can take it um, literally, in as far as it allows us to, okay, unless it tells us otherwise, and humbly and with reverence recognise the authority and the power that God has invested in his book. And so we want to be able to see, therefore, how the Bible can be made sense of. We have to believe that it can, otherwise we're wasting our time. If it can't be made sense of as a coherent whole, again, we're, we're wasting our time. So, let me begin. Um, so, this is, this is the flow of what we're going to do uh, for the next sort of 45 minutes or so. We'll start off by looking at covenant theology, which is one way of making sense of the Bible as a whole. And we will, I'll describe it to you as clearly as I can. It will have to be fairly succinct because time is limited, um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time sort of critiquing or evaluating um, some of the issues of covenant theology. There are some, there are some good things about it, which, we, which we'll mention as we go through, and there are some things that it throws up that are interesting, that are valuable. Um, and then we'll move on to dispensationalism, and then ultimately I want to recommend dispensationalism to you as the best way, the right way, to understand how scripture works together as a whole. Um, given some of the problems that appear when we take the covenant theology view. So there are two competing distinct ways of coming to the Bible, reading the Bible and taking from the Bible a coherent understanding of basically everything. Of, of who you are and who God is and how every, everything fits together and how to be saved and, and so on. So it's not going to be, maybe disappointing to you, but it's not going to be a polemic against the covenant theology position. Um, and there are several reasons for this, um, because first of all, I'm actually glad for the attempts that are being made by covenant theologians to start from the same starting point, which is to accept the Bible as true. Because there are too many people trying to create some kind of Christianity mesh with other ideas taken from all sorts of places and trying to wedge things together. So, so we don't want to be too hard on our brothers and sisters who are covenant who, who go along with covenant theology because they're genuinely saved, they're genuine Christians, um, but I think we have something to offer them, something to help them with in terms of understanding the Bible as a whole. Many helpful, um, godly men and women have produced some excellent materials under the, the framework, and most of those great writers, certainly of the Puritan era, most of them, if not all of them, would have come from this way of thinking and, and as we all know there are some great truths yeah. that, that those men and, and, and those women um, have, have shown to us, it's undeniable and so we're not going to deny it <laughs> um, just to score some points or, or to seem to be forthright when it's not necessary so having said that I do believe that covenant, uh, that dispensationalism sorry, dispensationalism is the right way of looking at the, at the text um, covenant theology is it seems to me inadequate and I hope to show why that is and I feel to some extent that the covenant theology reads into the Bible what's not there, and that's a problem. So we're going to summarise covenant theology, um, and then we're gonna, I'm going to put up ten critiques or ten problems that come out of a covenant theology um, view. Uh, then we'll go through dispensationalism, describe it, sketch it, explain how it all fits together, and then ex- try and explain briefly towards the end how that will all fit together, how it answers some of those questions that covenant theology throws up. Okay, so let's get to covenant theology itself. So, like I say, I want to be as faithful as possible to to those that have written from a covenant theology point of view, because they're our brothers and our sisters, and there's no point in us making a straw man argument and knocking it down and thinking that we've done well. Nobody is well served by that form of argument, so we should genuinely... Uh, genuinely desire the truth. So covenant theology begins um, with what is called the covenant of redemption. So this is the way that covenant theologians will make sense of the whole Bible. And the, the argument is that initially in eternity past, prior to the creation itself, God within his triune being, amongst himself, if I can use those terms, within the Trinity, there was a determination made that God would create and then redeem his creation. 
And so covenant theology begins with this as its first covenant. This is why it's called covenant theology. Its first covenant is called the covenant of redemption. And I've just put here that it is made within the triune Godhead. So without reference necessarily, without the influence or um, the, um, the requirement of man necessarily, God within himself and for himself decided that he would create and then he would then redeem that created order from the sin into which he knew it would fall. So covenant theology then teaches that in the creation itself that there is a covenant of works. That when God first created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden that God made a covenant with Adam. So a a covenant is essentially um, a life and death bond between two parties where the breaking of that covenant leads to the death of the breaker of the covenant. That's what a covenant essentially is. It's this life and death blood bond, if you like, between two parties that both consent to do something And if that covenant is broken by either party, then that party loses their life. That's that's how covenant theologians would describe a covenant. So, in the Garden of Eden, um, God made a covenant of works with Adam, whereby if Adam would keep the law of that covenant, Adam, by virtue of his obedience, would receive eternal life and thereby live forever in perfect union with God, in perfect fellowship with him in the Garden of Eden for all of eternity. That's what the covenant of works, as far as I understand it, that's what the covenant of works is. Um, To give you some some more on that, this is the Westminster Confession. So the Westminster Confession is a document very much um, in favour amongst our covenant uh, theologian brothers and sisters. The Westminster Confession, chapter 7 and section 2 says this. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works. That's where the term comes from. Wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. So the covenant of works was made with Adam and God said to Adam, if you keep my law in this garden in perfect submission and in perfect obedience, you and all of your posterity will live in perfect union with me and essentially there will be no fall. That's the covenant of works. But of course the Bible tells us and the Bible teaches us that there was a fall. So we don't need to rehearse that here for sake of time. But to suffice it to say that the covenant of works was broken by Adam, as we know, in the fall. As Adam and Eve took the fruit, disobeyed God, did what was um, against the law of God that we've seen here. Adam broke the covenant, and in breaking the covenant was sentenced, therefore, to death. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, would be the text. Okay. So, the covenant made with Adam... He has eternal life if he can, he can fully obey the law of God. We know that he failed to do that. And so, the covenant of works, one of the things, one of the texts, one of the key texts that the covenant theologian will turn to to say that God definitely made a covenant with Adam, because that is something that we will dispute later. God definitely made a covenant with Adam, says the covenant theologian, because it says so in Hosea 6-7. This is Hosea 6-7. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Now, it might strike you immediately, how does that support the idea that Adam, Adam and God made a covenant in the garden? How does that support that? Well, in every, almost every other version that you turn to, the, the phrase is, but they like Adam 
have transgressed the covenant. In almost every, ESV, NIV, RSV, almost every other version you care to name, I think with the exception of the New King James, um, pretty much, as far as I could tell, um, the ones that I've got at home, all of them say, but they like Adam. And it's from that text, or, or certainly that is the text that is lent upon to confirm that God made a covenant with Adam in the garden. Now, this will depend on your position on the King James Version, of course, but it seems interesting to me that the King James Version um, says that they like men. It makes a general point that men are covenant breakers, whereas other versions that have the name Adam in there are making a specific point. But I'll leave you with that. You make what you will of that fact. So, um, covenant theology goes on to say that as a result of the fall, where Adam disobeyed and broke that covenant of works, God then decided to institute another covenant. Another, uh, another covenant. A different covenant to the covenant of works. Decided to create, to inaugurate an, another covenant with Adam by which Adam could be restored and by which Adam could receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, And that would be received by Adam and his posterity through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is called the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace. So the covenant of redemption made within the triune Godhead before, uh, before the creation... In the creation, at the very beginning, there was this covenant of works made with Adam where he could have eternal life and so could all his children if he obeyed perfectly. But of course, we know that there was a fall. And then God graciously, according to the covenant theologian, intervenes and makes another covenant with Adam and with his posterity. um, The covenant of grace. The covenant of grace. So, those are all of the covenants in covenant theology. So those of you that, are, um, that have read through the whole of the scripture will know that, okay, so what about the covenant made with David? Where does that fit in? What about the covenant that was made with Abraham? What about the new covenant? What about the Mosaic? Where do they fit in? Well, the covenant theologian says that they are all part of the covenant of grace. The covenant made with Noah, the covenant made with Moses, the covenant made with Abraham, the covenant made with David, and the new covenant, um, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, all of those covenants are in, are within the covenant of grace. And actually, the covenant theologian describes them not so much as covenants, despite that, despite that being the way that the Bible describes them. The new covenant, the, the, the covenant theologian, sorry, describes all of those as being administrations of the covenant of grace. And that, for me, is the major sticking point. Uh, And I'll open that out in just a moment. Because the covenant theologian presumably has anticipated a host of questions about, okay then, so what about the Old and the New Testaments? What about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? Where Where do they fit in? And so the answer to that which I think is, is not a good answer. The answer to that is that all of the, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Mosaic Law, Abrahamic Covenant, they're all different administrations of the one covenant of grace. These are the words of, again, the Westminster Confession. So chapter 7, section 5. This covenant, <coughs> talking about the covenant of grace, this covenant was differently administered in the time of law and in the time of the gospel. Okay? So we can, we can agree that the law and the gospel are different. But the covenant theologian says they're not so different, basically, because they're part of the covenant of grace. They're, both, they're just a different administer, different ways that God has administered the one covenant of grace. A few sentences further on in the Westminster Confession. <coughs> Excuse me. We read this. There are not, therefore, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> there are not, therefore, two covenants of grace differing in substance. <coughs> but what, <coughs> excuse me. But one and the same under various dispensations. 
it's very unhelpful use of the word dispensations there because what is not meant is the same thing that we'll be talking about shortly when we do talk about dispensations. So here, covenant theology tries to bring in, under the banner of the covenant of grace, those that are named and that appear as actual covenants in the Bible, in the actual biblical narrative, which we'll, we'll come to in a moment. So the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, broadly seen as the same thing as the Old Testament, <clears throat> or in the terms of the Westminster Confession, the time of the law, the Davidic, the Noahic um, covenants are all just part of, they're all just different administrations, they're basically the same, the same substance is the words of the Westminster Confession. This, it's the same thing, it's just being administered slightly differently. Um, o. Palmer Robertson, I've got his book here, um, is generally this book, The Christ of the Covenants. If you want what is generally got regarded as the best uh, or one of the best introductions to covenant theology, this is it. Okay, So it's written from the perspective of a covenant theologian. So if you want it from their point of view, then I recommend this. It's, it's very well written. It's very easy to read. Um, I have some issues with it, as we'll go through in a minute. Um, but it's a, a very useful book if you really want to dig into um, the arguments um, that, that the covenant theologians would present us. Um, o. Palmer Robertson... Um, that book is called Christ of the Covenants and here is the diagram in his book of how he tries to explain how all of the covenants are part of the covenant of grace okay and he simply says he has slightly different terms so he has covenant of creation and covenant of redemption um, whereas he means covenant of redemption by covenant of creation I believe basically the other way around um, but nevertheless, the covenantal structure of scripture, according to O. Palmer Robertson, according to the, the, the head honcho, if you like, of covenant theology, um, looks like this. And that, that essentially, that as we go through time, that one covenant of grace is opened out and added to or administered differently, and they grow out from one another. So really, there is essentially, from Adam to the new covenant, in Christ, there is essentially no clear distinction. There's no real discontinuity between those, those biblical covenants, we'll call them, because they actually do appear in the Bible. There's no real continuity between them. All the covenants in the text proper of the Bible are just subcategories of the theological covenants that we've been presented already. So you can see Robertson uses slightly different designations for the names of the covenants. But essentially the, the idea is that the covenants are all interlinked. They're all of one substance differently administered. One sort of grows out from the other through time as the revelation of God continues on. But the key point is that they are interlinked. There's no substantive difference between them. They are essentially all the same covenant, just administered differently. That's quite an appealing way of looking at scripture because it's quite simple. It, keep, it does keep things nice and simple. It's simple to pick up and it's pretty simple to run with. Because you only really have a division at the fall, then everything after the fall, is, it's all basically the same. Differently administered, yes, but essentially all part of one covenant. And, and therefore it can seem on the surface of things to be, since, since that one covenant ultimately ends with the new covenant which is a covenant at all in this framework, it's just an administration, where we see how everything from Adam leads up to Christ, which is a good thing, a good way of looking at the scripture. But to say that everything from Adam leads to Christ or, or moves towards Jesus and his work on the cross is not the same thing as saying God has structured the Bible, God has structured reality in this way. It's not the same thing. We can still agree to that. We can still say, yeah, we can, we can see how the purposes of God have worked through time to bring about redemption through Christ Jesus. We have no problem with that. It's just reading these biblical covenants out of their context to put into a different context, those three covenants we spoke about previously. That is the problem. So it's appealing and it's understandably so. But I'm going to give you... Uh, at the risk of laying it on a bit thick, I'm going to give you 10 reasons um, why I think covenant theology is mistaken. Some of them are stronger arguments than others, um, so I'll be upfront about that. 
Um, some of them are extremely important arguments because they, they strike right at the heart of the gospel. So let's, let's just go through these. So we're going to look at 10 problems. Um, for those of you making notes, there'll be 10 of these. Um, we'll go through one at a time. And we'll take more or less time on each one. And this will be the bit where you'll need to grab your Bibles because we'll turn to a few passages as we go. So the first problem, some of these may have come to mind as, as you've been listening to me so far. The first problem is that we are relying on the assumption that God made a covenant with Adam in the garden. And that assumption is heavily reliant upon that verse in Hosea 6, which in my view is at best an illusion, not an illusion, an allusion, rather than a statement of fact regarding a particular covenant that was made. For me, that it seems clear to me that in Hosea 6, the point is not to, to say that God made a covenant with Adam. The point is actually to say that we all are covenant breakers by nature. Mm. That's the point. And that's how, if you read it in context, that's how chapter 6 of Hosea works. But this, this also throws up a problem. Because if God made a covenant of works with Adam in the garden and said to him, if you keep this law, you will live eternally. How does that then, from the covenant view, how does that stack up against by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified? How, do the, how, do you, how does the covenant theologian mesh those two things? If Adam is going to be justified by the keeping of the law that God gave him in the garden, and yet the Bible clearly says the just shall live by faith, the Bible clearly says, by the deeds of the law, it could be more specific, it couldn't be more accurate, it couldn't be clearer. Yeah. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Was Adam flesh? Well, he can't be justified by the keeping of any law. The de- by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. We are saved now, not by the keeping of the law, but by faith in Christ. Because by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. So that, that's the first problem, and, and that's a prickly one to get to get round. The second one, <clears throat> for me, is one of the two biggest ones, and that is basically, <clears throat> what is new about the new covenant? If the new covenant is just another administration of a, of a covenant that's been existing for a few thousand years, if the new covenant is just the final administration of a covenant of grace that began in Genesis chapter 3, What's new about the new covenant? Why does God say, why, why even call it a new covenant? Why not call it the last covenant? Why not call it the blood covenant? Why not call it the Christian covenant? But God himself, in the, in the plain text of scripture, repeatedly again and again, calls it the new covenant. So what is, what is new about the new covenant? Because from the covenant theology, theology point of view, it can't be classed as new from a chronological point of view. Because it was inaugurated in Genesis 3. It was made at the same time as the covenant of grace. Because it's part of the covenant of grace. It can't be classed as new in the soteriological sense. So, but the way of salvation it presents. Because the covenant theologian says that we've all been saved the same way since the garden. By faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That Christ on the cross died to bear our sins. And this is the gospel and we agree to this. That Christ on the cross died to take away our sins and that by putting our faith in him and his cross work, we are redeemed, justified, saved. But if, according to the covenant theologian, way back in Genesis 3, that's how people were saved too. Despite the fact that they knew nothing of Christ, as far as we can glean from the actual text of scripture, they knew uh, the handful of people in the Bible, we find out that they knew something of Christ. Sure. So Abraham knew something of Christ. Moses knew something of Christ. But these are shadows, these are types. So from, in terms of salvation, there's nothing new about the new covenant from their point of view, from the covenant theology point of view. Because the sa- way of salvation it presents is the same way of salvation since the fall. It can't be classed as new in an anthropological sense. That means to do with what a person is. 
and what happens to a person when they're saved. Because according to covenant theology, the new birth is experienced by all believers since Adam. At least that's, that's how I understand the argument. That the new birth, if we're all saved the same way since Adam, then we all receive the spirit just like Adam does. Let me just uh, go back for a moment. We all, we all receive the Spirit in the same way that Adam did and everybody since Adam. So in that, in that sense then, what's new about the New Covenant with regards to what it does to us or for us? Are we, are we born again in the New Covenant in the same way that you're born again in all other covenants? The, underneath the covenant of grace? What's the difference? What's new about the New Covenant? It can't be classed as new in the legal sense because according again to covenant theology the requirement of God for people in the entirety of the covenant of grace is, is the Ten Commandments. It's the law of God, it's the Decalogue. <clears throat> the, the Decalogue, this standard of legal righteousness runs through both the old and new covenant administrations of the covenant of grace according to covenant theology. So the exact same standard of legal righteousness is required right the way through. The only real difference according to covenant theology is in the outward forms, is in the, what, what they would call the administration is in the, the, um, the ordinances, as our Reformed brothers would say, in the ordinances. And basically, in the words of covenant theologians themselves, all we've got is two administrations of, of the one covenant. There's nothing... This, the problem with this, of course, is as soon as you get, to, for example, amongst other passages, to the book of Hebrews where there is a, a substantial chunk of the book of Hebrews which goes into depth and detail on how the old and the new are totally different. The old may have had types and shadows within it, but in terms of how it affects us from a salvation point of view, from a legal righteousness point of view, from an anthropological what is man, who am I now point of view, it's clearly completely different. And that is the point being made uh, in the book of Hebrews calling them different administrations when the writer of the Hebrew says that the, the new is better than the old and that the new has replaced the old and the old is ready to vanish away calling that different administrations of the same covenant is insufficiently biblical Absolutely. insufficiently biblical Absolutely. so that's the second thing I mean, that, that's a biggie um, we, could spend, we could spend another hour or so on that but we won't you'd be pleased to know um, third problem and I'll, I'll, I'll grant this one because I haven't fully um, tied this down yet. But I think, I think it appears to me in my reading of the New Testament at least that there needs to be a distinction between a covenant and a testament. And this will, this will come back in shortly. <clears throat> and again, the King James is really instructive on this point. Because I, I, I recommend you take the time to have a look at where the use of the word covenant and the use of the word testament are in the Bible. Um, in the King James in particular. Okay? Because you will notice, at least I think you will notice, as I have noticed, that when the word testament is used to describe the old and the new, the emphasis is always upon death. So a testament, as the book of Hebrews tells us, is only a force after men are dead. So the content of a testament, so the New Testament, for example, only becomes as after the death of Christ. A covenant, on the other hand, does not require the death before it's inaugurated. A covenant, <coughs> we said at the start, a covenant requires the death of the, of the breaker of the covenant but it doesn't require death in order to inaugurate the covenant. A testament is different. Death comes first in a testament and the blessings come after. In, in a covenant, the blessings come first and anyone who breaks it 
then the death comes. So they're different things. And if you read carefully, especially in the, again, the book of Hebrews, um, you'll see that the word testament is used, especially when the death of Jesus <coughs> is being spoken of. You go through the Gospels and look at when, when the Lord speaks about, this is um, my blood of the New Testament. Okay? Most, of, most other versions you look at will say covenant and have no distinction between them. But testament, it seems to me, is linked with death, whereas covenant is linked with life. And my, my feeling is that covenant theology fails to make that distinction, which I think is an important distinction, especially in the book of Hebrews. Especially in the book of Hebrews. They're not interchangeable terms. Um, however, and I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't bet my house on that. Maybe the car, but not the house. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the case, but I'm, I need to dig into that a bit further. So let's move on. Number four. This is the second big one, if you like. The second big one. The second big problem that that framework of covenant theology produces for us that we've got to overcome somehow. <clears throat> and that is that it collapses the distinction between Israel and the church. According to covenant theology, there is essentially no difference between Israel and the church. And, and from that point of view, you can see why they say that. Because if, if the new covenant, sorry, the, the covenant of grace begins at Adam and goes right through to Christ and all those that come after Christ who are in Christ, then of course that, that covenant of grace has to incorporate Israel and then it has to incorporate the church. We all have to be under that same covenant. And so therefore, there's no distinction made between Israel and the church. No, no clear, obvious distinction made between the two. And this creates loads of problems. Um, and I'm fairly sure we'll touch on this again later today in some of the other uh, messages that we hear. Let me turn you to just a small handful of passages to show where this creates a problem. Turn first of all, would you please, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Now, I'm going to present these as, as problems. Um, if we had a, a covenant theologian with us, they may have answers to these. Um, but I don't think there are any legitimate or substantial answers to these issues, which is why I tend, I, I am a dispensationalist. So, chapter 10 of Matthew, and what does Jesus say in beginning in verse 5? These twelve, the twelve disciples, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. How do we make sense from a covenant theology point of view, where all people are under the covenant of grace, how do we make sense of Jesus Christ sending his disciples to national Israel, people who are Israelites, after the flesh, that's what he's saying here. Don't go to the Gentiles, go to the, go to the Jews, go to Israel. How do we make sense of that if the covenant of grace is just differently administered in these different times? It's all the same covenant. Why not go to the Gentiles too? Why not? And of course we know once, once we get further on, the Gentiles do indeed... Uh, are indeed blessed by the new covenant. And we'll talk about how that works in a minute. Why does Jesus say, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Covenant theology, it seems to me, has a hard time explaining that. That's right. Has a hard time explaining it. Come to Romans um, 11. Romans 11. Look at verse 26. Let's start with verse 25, actually. So this Romans 11 is the passage where Paul is talking about the olive tree and grafting in and, and cutting off and so on. And then he gets to verse 25 and says this. So he's speaking, he's speaking to Roman um, brothers and sisters here. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. 
How does a covenant theologian make sense of that? If, if the church and Israel are basically the same thing, how can blindness happen to Israel while the Gentiles come into the church? How can blindness to Israel, if Israel and the church are the same thing, so we're saying that the church is blinded so the church can be made to see. That's what's, that's what's being said here. That doesn't make any sense. How is it that the Gentiles can come in by having their understanding enlightened, by turning in salvation to Christ, at the same time that Israel is being blinded, if Israel is the church? How can that be? And so all Israel shall be saved. It makes much more sense to see that Israel here means Israel. That's right. And not only does it make more sense, but it's a, it's a more straightforward and, it seems to me, honest reading of the actual text of Scripture. That's what the Scripture says. We're talking about Israel. <clears throat> Another thing that will be affected is our understanding of eschatology and end times. And so I think the next two messages will touch on those, particularly the, the third today in the conference today. The fourth um, problem under this heading is in Acts 15. Turn to Acts 15, would you please? Acts 15, just for a moment. So the covenant theologian position is that the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is, was inaugurated as part of the covenant of grace. So therefore, Adam after Genesis 3, was under this, the same Decalogue that Moses then delivered as a, as a law. That we push the Decalogue, we push the Ten Commandments, we push the law, basically, back from Moses, back in time, all the way to the, to the, the fall. And we push it forwards in time, basically, to, to take up the whole of the covenant of grace. So the, the, the law underpins the whole of the covenant of grace. So this throws, up, this throws up a problem here. Um, in Acts 15, um, from verse 28, verse 28, there we go, I haven't written it down. Verse 28, it seemed good, so, so the, the discussion here in Acts 15 is, Gentiles are being saved, what out of the law should we tell them to do? That's the question. The covenant theologian position is, well, keep it all. Right. Or, or if not keep it all, at least it's all relevant. We'll, we'll come to how they... I don't want to be too discourteous, but how they wriggle out of that one in a minute. So here's what they say. So a letter is sent from the apostles, um, from the council um, of the church, out to the Gentiles who are turning to Christ. Verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. It's not a law, they're just some necessary things. That ye abstain, verse 29, from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, ye you shall do well, fare you well. That's it. That's it. How is it that the covenant theologian reads the law right into the new covenant? When here we have, here are some necessary things. There's actually only four. If you can manage that, you'll be all right. Off you go. That, that's, that's literally what is being said here. If you, if you can keep yourself from these four things, as far as your life goes, you'll be all right. Farewell. Off you go. How does the covenant, the covenant theologian make sense of that? Make sense of the applicability of the law to the church, especially since by the works or the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Romans 9, Romans 9, please. So, Romans 9 and verse 4. Paul is saying here, he's speaking about national Israel. That's the point of this passage. He's saying that in verse 
3, he says this, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. It can't be more plain that he's speaking about Israel. Fleshly, national Israel. Verse 4, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the what? The covenants. And the covenants. And the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. To whom do the covenants and the law pertain? Fleshly. This is what Paul is saying. Fleshly. National Israel. Not spiritual Israel. Not the, the Israel of God. But actual fleshly Israel. National. Descended from Isaac and Jacob and, and Israel. Descended from Israel. That's who Paul is talking about. He's saying that the covenants relate to them. So how does the covenant theologian, expanding this covenant of grace out to everybody, how does, how does he make sense of this passage? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Next one. This is something we've mentioned already. It seems to me that covenant theology reads regeneration back into the Old Testament. That the, the indwelling spirit. But this doesn't stack up against what the Bible tells us when the Lord says um, that he will send the spirit. And the spirit will indwell. And he speaks in, uh, of that being in the future. Uh, Acts chapter 2 and, and onwards. And David himself says in Psalm 51, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Amen. Why would he say that if, unless he knew that that was a possibility? But at the regeneration... Part of what makes us regenerated is the indwelling, never departing Spirit of God Amen. within us. Amen. That is what makes us regenerate. <clears throat> and, and we cannot push that back into the Old Testament because it doesn't agree with the text. It may well agree with the covenant system, the covenant theology system, because you've got to get everything back all the way to Adam, all the way to the fall, in order for it all to be one covenant. Number six. Does the same thing with the law of Moses. This is a problem. It reads the Mosaic law back before Moses. So the covenant theologian would say that the law that was given to Moses was already in effect. It was just written down for Moses. Okay? And you can go back and there are one or two places where you might find, for example, when Noah sacrifices and he divides the birds and things like that. There are some, there are some hints maybe that there are some practices of the law that were already going on. But that's not the same thing as saying the, the entirety of the law, the Ten Commandments themselves, are to be read right back to the fall, from the fall all the way through to Christ. It's not the same thing. And if we do insist on pushing back the law um, to the fall, we've got a, we've got a problem. And it's the standard problem of, that the evolutionists would come up with. This is really interesting to me. The evolutionists would say, where did Cain get his wife? And we would say, well, it was his sister. But if we're now reading the law back to the fall, then that was sin for Cain to do that. Because the law, Leviticus, turn with me to Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. <clears throat> so Cain, where did Cain get his wife? We know that Cain got his wife from the biblical record he must have there's only one option he must have married his sister okay and that's the only option for him but in Leviticus 18 verse 9 we read this the nakedness of thy sister the daughter of thy father or daughter of thy mother whether she be born at home or born abroad even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover that's the law of Moses. If we're pushing the law of Moses back to the fall, Cain sinned in marrying his sister. But not only that, and worse than that, God gave him no other choice but to sin. Because he gave, him, he gave them the commandment to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and then gave the only option was for him to marry his sister. 
So God has caused, directly caused Cain to sin if we have to push this law back to the fore. And that's why we don't push the law back to the fore. Well, it's one of the reasons we don't. Here's, here's the wiggle room that I mentioned. Here, here is how um, the covenant theologian wiggles out of this issue. Okay? The covenant theologian simply divides the law up and divides the law into three parts and says there are bits of the law that we must keep and bits of the law that have been done away in Christ. So that therefore, when you come to a passage that says the law has been done away in Christ, the covenant theologian says, yeah, there we go. It's been done away in Christ. And we come to a passage where it might suggest that there are laws um, in the New Testament. The covenant theologian says, there you go. That's because the law is still standing. No biblical writer splits the law in this way. There's, there's no biblical writer that, that says anything like the law has to be divided into three, into three parts. Um, standard practice amongst covenant theologians is to split the law into civil law. You may have even heard these terms before. Civil law, ceremonial law, and moral law. Now, there are laws that are civil laws. There are laws that are ceremonial laws. There are laws that are moral laws. But at no point does the Bible distinguish them and draw them out from one another. The law is a coherent whole. The law stands together. It's either all the law or not the law. What, do, what does James say in James 2? If you offend in one point, you're guilty of that, that third of the law that you've broken. Now, you, if you offend in one point, whether it's moral, civil, ceremonial, offend in one point, you've broken the whole law. Because the law is a whole and cannot be divided. But by doing this, dividing the law into three parts... The covenant theologian allows himself to hold on to the law as part of the covenant of grace. That's paradoxical at best, that the law could be part of the covenant of grace. But anyway, so he has to hold on to the law as part of the covenant of grace, as well as having the law abrogated and done away in Christ. You can't can't have both of those things. And so in order to get around that, the law gets split into three parts. And the covenant theologian wiggles through the gaps. But it's, it's not a biblical division. You will not find in the Bible a clear division where any of the biblical writers, especially in the New Testament, you can have a look. The New Testament does not divide up the civil, the ceremonial and the moral law. It just speaks of the law. Romans, back to Romans 11 again for me, please. Romans 11. Uh, this links in with number... Number four, the distinction between Israel and the church. But it's quite a biggie. So I'll put it on its own. So Romans 11. I need to speed up a bit, I'm sorry. Um, Romans 11. We've got the failure of covenant theology to distinguish between election and the gospel. Now, of course, this depends on whether or not you're a Calvinist. Um, I'm not a Calvinist um, because I see a distinction between election and the gospel. And what better place to turn to show that distinction than where Paul also shows that distinction. So, Romans 11 and verse uh, 26 Let's, let's remind ourselves, we've just read part of this passage, let's remind ourselves we're talking about national Israel here. Verse 26, So all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. The gospel is not election, and election is not the gospel. Election is the choosing that God has done of the nation of Israel. That's what election is. The gospel is when we come to Christ in faith for the remission of our sins under his shed blood. That's the gospel. Those two things are not the same. It it could barely be any clearer than it is in that verse, verse 28. 
As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Not, not God the Father, but the fathers as in um, plural fathers, the patriarchs. Next one. Again, this depends on, on your theology a little bit. But these, these, these theological um, points come out from covenant theology. So, number nine, it supports the scripturally unfounded practice of baptising babies. Covenant theologians baptise their children as, as babies in order, to inaugurate, in, in order to welcome them into the covenant. But there is no, there is no New Testament example of the baptising of babies. Despite a couple of passages that might be turned to where households were baptised, still doesn't say their babies were baptised. Still doesn't say that they were not believers. So we hold to believers' baptism. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There's, no, there's no evidence, it seems to me. It's not clearly commanded, certainly. And it's not obviously practised anywhere within the New Testament church. It's not required by Paul, in particular, in any of his letter writing. He gets down to the level of telling women that they shouldn't braid their hair. If baptising babies was an important part, he would have mentioned it, surely. Okay. Finally, number 10. It assumes, the covenant theology assumes that the shadows and the types of the Old Testament were fully understood by the people at that time. Because, as we've said, the covenant of grace, we benefit from the covenant of grace by faith in Christ, according to the covenant theologian, by faith in Christ, by his shed blood, by seeing him on the cross, by turning to him in faith and casting all our sin upon him, the way that the gospel tells us we're saved today. There is almost no evidence that any Old Testament saint fully understood that. There were hints here and there, as we've mentioned. But covenant theology has to assume, because otherwise how would they be saved? If, if faith is in the shed blood of Christ Jesus, is the way that they're saved, the covenant theology has to assume that they understood that, that, that Moses understood that, that Abraham understood that. But not just these great men of God, but the people, all the faithful people, the 7,000 that had not bowed um, in Elijah's time, all 7,000 of them understood that Jesus Christ would come as the Messiah, that he would live a perfect life, that he would go to his death on the cross, take upon himself the sins of the world, die as a substitution in the place of um, every sinner. They I find it hard to believe, because the reason I find it hard to believe, not simply because I'm incredulous, but simply because it's not in the, it's not in the book. It doesn't say so. There's nowhere it's evident in the scripture that they understood that that's what was going to happen. Now, I'm not saying they, they weren't saved by faith. They were saved by faith, but not faith in the shed blood of Christ. And this is the mistake that's made. The Old Testament saints, Abraham, for example, his faith was counted as righteousness. So he was saved by faith. But what was it that he believed? He believed that God would give him a son. He believed what God had told him to believe. Which wasn't the full information about who Christ was and how he would come. Abraham in Romans 4 is not commended for faith in Christ, but faith in God and what God had shown him. He was expected to put his trust in God. Now today that's insufficient because Christ has come. He's come in the flesh and, it, and he commands every, every man everywhere to repent. So that is how we're saved today. But you cannot read that back all the way to Abraham or prior to Abraham. This assumption that the types and the shadows are understood um, in New Testament fullness way back in the Old Testament, it doesn't even stack up in the New Testament record. Because why is it that the disciples rebuked Christ for saying that he was going to the cross? Clearly, they were his disciples. Of course they were his disciples. They clearly did not understand the importance of the cross. The narrative is plain that they didn't understand the importance of the cross. So we cannot push faith in the shed blood, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. We cannot push it back as the means of salvation all the way back into the Old Testament. What we can do, however, is recognise that in God's plan, that the shed blood of Christ eventually 
remits those sins under the old order, under the previous dispensations, which we'll come to shortly. We can't assume, for example, that in the narrative of Genesis 22, where Abraham offers up Isaac, we look at that and we see, wow, what a, what a fantastic picture of Christ and his sacrifice in our place at the cross. There's no evidence that Abraham understood that that's what he was doing. He was simply following what God had told him to do. And it was that faith that made him righteous in God's eyes. His salvation was imputed to him because of his faith, but the object of his faith cannot be shown to be the finished work of Jesus Christ. So I'm I'm going on a bit long here, so I'm going to have to speed up. So we're going to just very quickly, and I'm I'm sorry that this is going to have to be quick, so please ask me uh, later over coffee if, if I miss anything out. Dispensationalism. So, the covenant theologian argues that we have different ordinances within the covenant of grace that distinguish between New and Old Testaments. Um, And that's why they will have baptism in the place of circumcision and so on. So, it's the same thing. It's it's the sign, it's the seal of of entering a a child into the covenant. It used to be circumcision and now it's baptism so they keep the same substance but they change some of the ordinances dispensationalism however does basically the opposite that there are some practices some ordinances that might might go through but the substance has fundamentally changed in the way that god deals with man so there might there might be some things that run through the system there might be some things that run through we'll come to this in a second run through the different dispensations and there will be but fundamentally, there are discontinuities. There is a change, a fundamental change in the way that God deals with mankind. And this fits much more neatly into the actual biblical narrative. There are clear changes in the way that God deals with mankind. Apologies if that's a little bit small. I'll, I'll talk through it in just a second. So, first key distinctive. Um, to emphasise in dispensationalism is discontinuity. So that it seems to be one of the faults of covenant theology is to try and get everything under one covenant. It's to push things that don't match, push them all into the covenant of grace, creating some of those problems that we've seen. Dispensationalism solves that problem in a biblical way, it seems to me, by sticking with the biblical narrative in the divisions that the Bible provides for us to understand when and where God changes his dealing with man. And it seems to me that this discontinuity can be understood um, from that often quoted phrase, rightly dividing the word. The word is to be divided. Now I think to some extent the dividing of the word means to, to give out the word to the right people at the right time. But it can also be understood in this sense and I think that's fair. The objection to this is usually, yeah, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so, so why have you got so many, why have you split things up if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever? And the answer, I realise that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. But what are you going to do with the incarnation? What are you going to do with the fact that at one time he wasn't come in the flesh and now he is come in the flesh? He's still the same yesterday and today and forever, but... But things have changed. Things can change in the way that God deals with man without God himself changing. Without Jesus Christ being different. There's no need to make that argument. Does, does God not require different things of different people? Of course he does. There's, 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 no, there's no change in God's nature himself. There's no change in who he is. He requires parents to behave in different ways to children. He requires elders to behave differently to young men. He requires husbands to behave differently to wives. But he's the same God. And to say that dispensationalism rides roughshod over the idea that God is the same doesn't make sense. It doesn't stack up against all these other ideas. It's no different, really. Jesus is the same. Of course he is. Uh, and, our, and God the Father is the same. And yet he deals with us differently, just as he deals with each one of us differently. There's no reason to see a problem there. So we've got these definite breaks, these discontinuities. Dispensationalism 
Um, there are various ways of splitting up the Bible. Dispensationalism is just essentially beginning with the idea that we can we can split the Bible up into clear time frames, um, or, or clear not so much time frames, but clear ways in which God deals with mankind. These are the classic ones. So we, we start with creation to the fall, which is the the dispensation of innocence. Then fall to the flood, which is the dispensation of conscience. Then from the flood to Babel is human government. We haven't got time to go into all of these, unfortunately, but I can do later if you want to speak to me about it. From Abraham to Moses is the dispensation of promise. From Moses, I've, instead of to Jesus, I've actually changed that to John, because the law and the prophets were till John, um, according to the Lord. Um, so the dispensation of law is Moses to John. The dispensation of grace is from the cross right through this is where we are now in terms of our the way that god deals with us he deals with us under the dispensation of grace right up to the millennial reign which we'll hear about later and then from the millennial reign into eternity is can be perceived as the final dispensation the dispensation of the fullness of times is the way that the bible would describe it so the, this is what classical dispensationalism sees and we've got definite discontinuity let's take the flood as an example so the flood comes between the dispensation of conscience and human government and the flood is a it's it's a definite discontinuity it's a definite break a definite division if you like in god's dealing with mankind he made clear his reasons for judgment prior to that that the earth was filled with violence because of man's inherent wickedness and God acted de- decisively to intervene in judgment the whole of humanity was wiped out save for eight people now if that isn't a discontinuity I don't know where you're going to find one um, that is a fundamental alteration in God's dealing with mankind So we have these dispensations, it might be a set of laws or some expectations of a particular kind. And then God holds those people under that dispensation accountable for the things, for the the revelation he's given to them. So typically these, these are they, seven or eight dispensations usually. The great thing about, about this is we have a consistency in interpretation. A consistency in the literal interpretation um, we as dispensationalists we adhere to a literal reading of scripture so we've mentioned already when we see the name Israel we think of Israel rather than something else um, the, all these great great swathes of prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament have been literally fulfilled there's no reason to suppose that those that have already been fulfilled were done literally and those that are yet to be fulfilled will be done in some kind of allegorical or spiritual way. Why not just read the Bible consistently throughout? When the Bible, for example, describes the size and the shape of the land of the millennial inheritance for Israel, we can be confident that what's been spoken of is that actual land and it will actually extend in those directions for that particular size. And from a, from a point of view of a dispensationalist, I would, I would sooner stand at the judgment before God and have the accusation that I took the Bible too literally than be accused of not taking it literally enough. That seems to me a better side of the fence to fall on if indeed we must fall on one side or the other. The other good thing, uh, or the other the, the, um, a benefit of looking at this uh, uh, scripture in a dispensational sense is that it actually gives us room for the covenants it actually gives us room for the covenants because we read in the bible that there are covenants we just don't read the covenant theologians covenants these overarching covenant redemption covenant of works covenant of grace we see the actual covenants in the scripture the covenant made with abraham the covenant made with noah and so on so there's a place in the dispensational scheme Oh, well, we'll go back to this one. There's a place in the dispensational scheme. Some of these dispensations are characterised by a covenant, but not all of them. And we don't have to make it so. We don't have to force it in just because we want it to be. We want God to always deal with us as in covenant um, terms. So, in the clear language of Scripture, rather than imposing some overarching covenants over them, we've got, for example, the period of time between Abraham uh, and Moses, the, the the dispensation of promise. There's, a, there's a, a covenant that runs through that. The covenant made with Abraham. Okay? In fact, it does continue on. 
but, it's, but it characterises the dispensation of promise. Um, and then the law. The law comes along. The law is a different thing. The law is not a covenant as such. It's a, it's a continuation of some elements of the Abrahamic covenant, but in and of itself it's a law that's separate from the Abrahamic covenant. It introduces the idea of a testament at that point, which is the first time the idea of testament comes up. So we get a testament in the, in the dispensation of law. It's the first time that, that crops up in the Bible. And we're using biblical terms to explain how the Bible fits together, which seems to me the right way to do it. The period of time between the fall um, and Noah, the dispensation of um, conscience, there's no covenant attached to it. Um, and there's no need to force one in there. And so the, the great benefit of dispensationalism is that it just allows us it allows us place for the biblical covenants. It allows us to keep to a literal interpretation of scripture. It allows us to see clear discontinuity in the narrative, which is there, definitely there. And it solves those ten problems that we looked at earlier. I haven't got time because my time's basically gone. Um, so thank you for sticking with me. So let's just, let's just very quickly conclude. Um, we know according to scripture that God's purpose is to bring all things together in Christ this is what Ephesians 1 9 and 10 says having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him God's purpose is to bring all things together ultimately in the fullness of times but what he doesn't do here in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ he's gathering all things to Christ he isn't collapsing the distinction between us all he isn't, he's gathering us all to Christ. He's not making us all as one. He's making us all in one. So we don't need to have this great collapsed covenant of grace where everything all piles in and fits in together. We can still have Israel and the church. We can have election and for Israel and we can have the gospel for the church and so on. We can still hold these distinctions and yet come to the point where God is gathering all things in one. That is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the fulfilment, is, the, is the, the spearhead of history. Where all the dispensations will ultimately end. And so, we are to be gathered together in one. So the actual relationship between Israel and the church, it seems to me, I'm going to leave you with this to think about this. Because this has helped me. The best way to think about the relationship between Israel and the church is not that they are so far apart that never the twain will meet. Because there are some passages that suggest there are blessings that we share. And, but the answer is also not to just wedge the two together to make them the same. The best way to perceive the relationship between Israel and the church is one of family. The church is the bride of Christ. Israel, according to Jeremiah, is the wife of the father. And so where Israel and the church are brought together in one, in one family, by marriage, we're brought together in one, we're not made the same. Just as my father's wife, my mum, is not the same person as my wife. But yet we're in the same family. And we share some of the same blessings. We share blessings of being with one another and speaking with one another and loving one another. We share the blessings of family without us having to be the same individuals. Same is true of Israel and the church. We share the blessings of being part of the household of God. Being brought together. Not made the same. Not made as one. But made together in one. And that one of course is Christ I've gone quite a bit over time I do but I really thank you for bearing with me I really appreciate it um, but we'll finish there thank you very much